You can't hear me. Mic check. <laughs> I'm, I'm going back to the 90s, my formative years. Mic check. One, two, one, two. Okay. No, seriously, can you hear me now? Does this sound better? Okay, thank you. To my colleagues at the tables, we have been told by Mr. Tim and Nathan, thank you all for setting us up, Tim and Nathan, that when you speak, press the, the right button and then it'll turn red and then turn it off and then we can go from there. Okay, thank you all for being here today. Uh, before we get started with the agenda, I do want to take a point of privilege and just um, say thank you, Gil, for or Dr. Wright for um, making this happen. I know we talked about this last year in terms of coming out to the community uh, and having a meeting. And then we also talked at the retreat that we had in December about coming to Woodbine specifically to highlight the work that's being done here and bring awareness to the community. I will tell you that another um, committee or board that uh, actually rotates their meeting through the community is the community oversight board. And so they're able to make sure that there's visibility and buy-in for community members. And it just, um, it, it keeps us honest, if you would, in making sure that we don't get com comfortable in our routine. Um, before we get started, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Wright, for a couple of comments. Thank you. Um, we would like to start out, and I'm going to recognize Dr. Black. We have a, a guest with us that I'd like for her to introduce, if she would. I think I heard the instructions correctly. Am I supposed to press a button or something? I'm on. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, or maybe it's, uh, yes, good afternoon. My name is Dr. Melba Black. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm the Deputy Director for the Department. Today is a pre-celebration for me personally because um, we have in attendance uh, Attorney Wintress Patterson, who on Monday, February 13th, will join officially join the Department as our brand spanking new HR manager. So. Uh, <laughs> Some of you may know that I've been serving in the interim role as HR manager, and I cannot tell you how delighted I am going to be on Monday come 8 a.m. So, uh, uh, but just a little bit uh, before I invite Attorney Patterson to come up, she has um, been with the school sy system with MNPS for X number of years, I'll ask her to fill in the, in the blanks, uh, serving in their HR department. And uh, we have been exceptionally fortunate because not only does she come with a wealth and breadth of experience, but she also comes highly recommended to uh, the department and her resume is the requisite blend that we need to continue to advance the work for uh, in public health and certainly in, in some roles that will help us retain staff and, and build that professional development. So just excited to have her join us and certainly to get to work come Monday. Um, uh, I can't stress that enough, but <laughs> and so I certainly want to invite Attorney Patterson to come up and introduce herself uh, to the board and to those in attendance. Thank you so much. Well, good afternoon. As uh, Dr. Black has stated, I have a little familiarity with um, health because I did, prior to going to schools, work for Metro HR General. And that's when uh, Dr. Wright and I had a working relationship because I did all the coordination for uh, the um, civil service. Uh, cases that came before the board. So I have a little familiarity and I did some investigations, at least two, I believe, that were significant when I worked for uh, Metro HR. And then I went over to schools and have had a good career there in employee relations. 
and um, now I'm with you guys. I um, hope that we can uh, get to know each other and work well together as I have done with other places that I've been. Metro has been good to me and I hope to continue that and working with Metro Legal and, and all the other departments that I have uh, had the pleasure of interfacing with have gone well and I look forward to continuing that with you all. Any questions for me? Okay, well, I'll be seeing you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I wanted to have uh, Laura Arnier come up and uh, tell us a little. Uh, first of all, thank you for uh, hosting here today. Um, I know that several of your staff are out, so otherwise I'd like to have them introduced, but they're not here. Um, I appreciate all of the work that Facilities has done to get this ready for us. I uh, appreciate the fact also that Metro's three here is here to, to record this for us. But uh, I would like for you to give a little introduction and a little talk about Morat, yeah. if you don't Good mind. Good afternoon, Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board. My name is Laura Varney. I'm the Bureau Director for Clinical Services here. And welcome to Woodbine. I think on behalf of Carlene Fanfan, who's our clinic manager, Karen, who is our, Karen Bess, who is our um, office support specialist, Lauren Cromer, who is here today, who's over the WIC program, and Molly Fitzgerald, who manages WIC here. I would just like to welcome you all to this uh, gymnasium slash cafeteria slash uh, auditorium that we're in today. Uh, as you can see, our, our team has done a wonderful job, but uh, this building was erected in 1920 and converted into a clinic in 1989. Um, there are quite a few wonderful things that we like about it. We love the neighborhood. But uh, geographically, and just given the age of the building, we need to be more southeast from where we are, and we need to be in a more up-to-date clinic-specifically built space. Um, we see about 3,500 patients on the preventive health side of things, and over 4,500 visits in the last six months. This is by far our largest volume clinic. Um, and we have grown to capacity of the space that we can have uh, with providers and nurses here, as have uh, Lauren and her team just given clerical space in this facility. So um, we have been given a $1 million uh, kind of design uh, budget to start looking, but really we've got to find some land on where we need to build this place. And like I said, given the WIC population and given the preventive health population, we've seen that we need to be more south and east of where we are right now. Um, we need to be on a bus line and we need to be somewhere that's built to do clinic services. So um, we're really excited. There's so much wonderful uh, potential here. We're even gonna have a garden coming in the next couple of months. Uh, some families would like to build a community garden, but we know that we need to get out of here and get somewhere that's gonna help us serve our patients a bit better. Uh, right after this, I'm happy to give a tour of the actual facility. So, I look forward to having you all join me as we walk through the clinic space. So, thank you so much and welcome to Woodbine. Thank you. All right, thank you, thank you Laura. And thank you, Dr. Wright. Okay, uh, first agenda item, approval of January 12th, 2023 meeting minutes. When ready, I will entertain a motion. Motion, motion to approve. Second. Motion made by Dr. Smith, seconded by Dr. Williamson. No discussion. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Uh, next, uh, Mr. Diamond, uh, we have approval of grant applications and approval of grants and contracts. Uh, yes, Chair Franklin, members of the board, we do not have any applications this month, so I'll move to the grants and contracts, and there were three in your advance packet for your consideration. Uh, one is an amendment to the community health worker grant. Uh, it re-obligates $1 million of unused funding from a previous grant period to the current one. Uh, item number two is uh, partial funding for the uh, Ryan White Part A uh, for the next grant cycle, $811,526. And item number three is a donation from the Friends of Mac for emergency medical services for $10,000. And just a reminder that any donations that have a specific purpose tied to them have to be treated as a grant because we have to track every dollar spent uh, via that donation. So it is handled as, as a grant. Okay. 
Great, thank you. I will entertain a motion so we can move forward with discussion. So moved. Motion made by Ms. Etherington. Second. Seconded by Dr. Smith. Discussion? I'll, I'll start. For the Community Health Workers Grant Amendment, I noticed that um, the term ends August 30th, 2023. Can you give us an under, a better understanding on if the funds now totaling two million will be able to be spent within that time frame? Fine, we expect that to. I'll defer to Dr. Harris. Thank you. Madam Chair, the, the answer to that is uh, they are going to allow us to continue the use of those funds um, into the next year uh, with the possibility of continuation beyond that. You said possibility. Yes, of continuation beyond the uh, two year grant. Okay. Yes, but okay. we will be able to roll over those funds. And also there will be some support funds through our new workforce development grant that will support the continuation of that work. Okay, thank you. Hold on. Did you have a follow-up? Just, just the, when you say they, you're talking about CDC? CDC, okay. yes. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. All in favor? Uh, any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Sure. And now we have a uh, facilities overview. Sure. Uh, much like last month, I was asked to, to speak about our uh, security staff members, and uh, now I was asked to speak about our facilities uh, staff. Um, and I, I could not be more, more proud of, of the work that, that this group of, of, of women and men do. Um, and, and I think this is an appropriate uh, facility in which uh, to have this discussion because, um, as Laura mentioned, it's it's it, it's an older building and requires a lot of upkeep and maintenance. And uh, I'm extremely proud of the effort that all of our security, uh, or excuse me, all of our facility staff puts in to keep this uh, building uh, functional as well as all all of our buildings. So uh, we have uh, 15 FTEs allocated to our facility staff. Uh, two of which are included are security guards, which I sp spoke uh, about last uh, last month. Uh, Fourteen of those uh, FTEs are locally funded, and one is funded under the, the WIC grant. Um, and just kind of a, an update to our um, security discussion we had last month. We, we do have uh, contracted security staff that has been added at Woodbine and East uh, starting within the the last couple of weeks. So we do have supplemental security staff through Archangel who provides security at Lentz. So we, we do have a little more security coverage for the uh, actual hours that our, our buildings are, are open. So um, our, our 13 FTEs are distributed our facility staff uh, between our, our courier custodians, maintenance and inventory and our print shop as well. Uh, Mark Sturgis is our facility services manager. He, he runs the, the security and facilities operations, and he's been in this position since 2011. Um, we have two employees classified as couriers. One is Ed Watkins, who, um, if you've been around the health department, you've, you've seen Ed uh, quite a bit. Uh, he's been in a uh, Metro Health Department employee since 1984. He's the fifth longest tenured uh, MPHD employee. So. He uh, ha has a route that takes him all over the city each day, and uh, there's special requests made of him every day as well. So he, he hits all of the MPHD facilities, uh, you know, the, the downtown main metro buildings, State Lab, uh, and is kind of on call to, to go and pick up checks at the last minute. And um, anyone who's driven around uh, Nashville since 1984 has noticed it's, it's more and more difficult to get places uh, over the last 40-ish uh, uh, years. So Ed, uh, Ed's just a mainstay with the department. Uh, the other employee classified as a courier is Jeffrey Baugh. He's, uh, he's on the WIC grant and stationed uh, at, at uh, South Nutrition Center. Uh, Jeffrey is the, the WIC clerk. Uh, courier, but he also handles a lot of custodial duties and everything else. Uh, he's been a Metro Health Department or Metro employee since 1984 and with the Health Department since 2001. So if you include his his time uh, 
out uh, with Metro Schools. He's the fourth longest tenured <laughs> Metro employee at, at, at the health department. We have five uh, custodians, uh, two of which are located at Lentz, one at East, one at Woodbine, and one that uh, floats between East and Woodbine. And the two who are located at Lentz, I know uh, the board has seen quite a bit, uh, Tyrone Stewart and Tony Dodson. Um, they do more than basically what one would consider traditional custodial work. They, they handle a lot of the, the room setup, breakdown, uh, anything related to the facilities and the rooms. They uh, even, I don't know if you, if you get to the board meetings early, you probably see them trying to work, wipe fingerprints off of the, the tables at, at, in the boardroom. They're, they're that thorough and, and that proud of, of the work that they do. Uh, Mr. Stewart has been a health department employee since 1998, Mr. Dodson since 2005. Uh, Ricardo Jimenez is our custodian at East. He's been a Metro MPHD employee since 1994. And Carlos Pineda, uh, Pineda is the custodian at, at Woodbine. He and I started December 1st of 2000. So Carlos and I have been with uh, the health department the, the same exact same amount of time. Remember, we went through orientation together. And Donna Bond uh, handles kind of both Woodbine and East supplementing uh, off time and as well as, as off days. And Don has been with us since 2007. Uh, our inventory and print shop is led by Catherine Carrera, who is one of the most organized people I've ever met. Um, she uh, does not have a large space uh, in our inventory area. I don't know if any, any or any, all of any of you have ever been in the basement at, at Lentz, but it's not a big inventory area and she, has to manage the supply orders for all of our clinics and all, uh, all, all the different buildings. So uh, she uh, w was incredible, especially during COVID at sourcing and finding things that were difficult to find, gloves, PPP, PPE of all kinds. So Catherine uh, is, is amazing. She started in the, uh, the CSFP program in 2013 and has been in her current role since 2019. Uh, Nick Compton is an equipment and supply clerk in, in our inventory area. Uh, Nick has been with us since 1994 and has recently submitted his, uh, his retirement paperwork. So Nick's going to be leaving us uh, uh, here before too long at the end of the month. But uh, Nick, Nick is, is another one that's, that's been a staple uh, of, the, uh, of the facility staff. And Patrick Washington is also classified as, as an, an equipment and supply clerk, but his main functions are running the, the, uh, the print shop, the, uh, the area of, of the department. So he handles a lot of the, the sign printing and uh, you know, farming out of larger jobs to our contracted vendor, and, you know, maintaining paper and the copiers, things like that. So, um, and our maintenance staff, again, uh, Terry Grimes, I'm sure a lot of you have been exposed to. He, he's been with the health department since 1982. He's our second longest tenured uh, employee at the department. And Terry uh, is, is just an amazing uh, person. Laura, Laura talked a little bit about, you know, this building, but Laura and Terry got to spend a lot of quality time together. You know, when there were storms or anything that knocked the power out here, they, they would come here and, and get the vaccine and transport it back to Lentz so that we didn't lose, uh, lose vaccines. So I know they had a lot of 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. phone conversations and arrivals here uh, at, at Woodbine. But uh, Terry uh, does an amazing job of, of getting to all of our different facilities. Again, our, you know, when you're talking about Mac and Woodbine and East and Lentz, they're, they're not easy to get to, they're not close together. And, but uh, Terry has just an intimate knowledge of, of all of our facilities and how to get things fixed and as well as um, you know, who to call to uh, help out when the, the HVAC at Mac goes out uh, you know, at, on a 100 degree day because uh, obviously with, with, with animals out there, we, we need to get things addressed quickly or else, uh, you know, some negative consequences can occur. So, uh, another one is, is Brian. Brian's kind of hanging out on the stairs over there, but Brian's one of our more recent, uh, hires. Brian's been with us since, uh, 2019 as a, a facilities maintenance technician and, uh, Brian, Brian's, you know, just folded in well with, uh, with, with, with Terry and Mark and the rest of the staff. And again, trying to, trying to learn some of the intricacies of, of all of our different buildings and how, how well they, they operate are, are doing large parts of a lot of things that Brian and Terry and Mark do to, to keep them running. So, um, 
I know he doesn't seek a lot of attention, but that's uh, Brian did a lot to uh, make this a possibility uh, as well, getting getting this uh, this room set up and uh, temporary air units and tables and everything set up. So uh, I just wanted to, to recognize Brian. But uh, that's that's our, our facility staff in a nutshell. I'd be happy to answer uh, any questions uh, about them or our facility operations. Thank you. Um, very good presentation. I know we don't have audiovisual here. I was hoping that you could include your presentation in the minutes sure. uh, so we can have a record of our unsung heroes. Yeah, I, I do want to absolutely on that. I just want to make sure I get some pictures of them so that you can have uh, faces with the names so that I can insert into the uh, into the, the kind of the notes that I threw through together because I know uh, we did that with security staff, but um, the uh, these ladies and gentlemen don't get a lot of a uh, lot of publicity or uh, uh, FaceTime with with the board or the public or anything. Yes. But they, they do such a such an invaluable uh, service for for the department and for for the people that we serve. That uh, if they didn't do what they did, we it would definitely be noticed. Absolutely. Thank you, That's Carol. Right. Do you know this would all employees, but. Um, especially this facilities team that's been here so long, so many of them. What about insurance? Because there's a big to-do going on in Metro for retirees. And I just wonder if anybody, and maybe we don't want to discuss it now, but I think as a board, it would be important for us to know when somebody retires from the health department, do they go straight into Metro's insurance thing and or do they have a choice of which insurance they can can get because there's a brouhaha with with some segments right now sure i um you know, i can't answer specific uh, to each employee but uh employees who are vested in metro's pension plan would, would also qualify for metro's insurance uh you know at retirement uh, as well um i believe uh, in talking with others once they reach social security age social security uh, would take precedence, and Metro's insurance right. would act act as a secondary uh, to that. But so you haven't had any issues with recent retirees or pending retirees being concerned about where they can get their health care, depending on which insurance they have. No, I, okay. it's the same insurance options uh, that for, made, to, for retirees as it is for for employees. We have well, we have and two that's options. why I'm asking the question. So, yes, it's a big deal. Okay. Are you talking about specifically for Metro? Are you talking about what's happening in the with Humana? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good question. And I don't know if if Jim, I yeah, don't want to put Jim it, on the spot, but I think it, that but is, it is something. something that I think that we just need to make sure right. that as we have people retire from the health department, that they're that we have an understanding if they're going to get into a bind depending on where they go for their health care. But that's a social determinant of health, so yeah. it would make sense for us to have our eye on that. Do you know? Um, probably want to discuss that with benefit board. This is, this but is. Jim's uh, summary is essentially correct my understanding is the change in retiree benefits was previously you remained under metro's coverage even after you became medicare eligible now you roll into medicare no longer under metro's policy you then are offered supplemental coverage and that's where when you're in a medicare program it's not locally controlled or negotiated it's at a federal level so that's where the bind is occurring, the Humana contract. That, Metro doesn't control the contract that Humana and Vanderbilt or other health care providers may have. So it's I'm not sure it's within Metro's ability to control that issue. Uh, but I think the benefit board is where you would start uh, in terms of that benefit. The, the Metro Employee Benefit Board is um, the board that sets all benefits for all employees 
Um, and so that I know has been a topic there. Um, so and we can get further information and get you directed to that, but we don't have direct knowledge at the moment. Are there other questions or comments? Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, next, we have the legislative update by Mr. Sharp. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you should have uh, uh, two pages that says my bills up here at the top. Um, these are the more, um, it seems, direct um, punish Nashville kind of bills that are at the, uh, in the legislature. What you have there is I went to the legislative website and just pulled up the status for these bills um, at the risk of being oversimplifying things, a quick primer on how they do these things. So they will file identical bills in each house. Um, and they, if they get amended on one side, it has to get amended on the other side. Um, so that, that in the end, the thing that they're voting on in each chamber is identical. Um, what these show you, if you look under the last action column, um, so that first one, HBO 48, that's the one that, that cuts the Metro Council in half. Um, it's on a subcommittee in the Senate and it's in, this, in a state and local government committee in the House. So it's still, it hadn't gone very far. Um, and the same thing is, uh, is true with the that 1176 is one of the board takeover, board membership takeover bills. 1197 is another one. And uh, 0648, the Senate bill, the last one, that's the one that would um, uh, el basically eliminate a lot of the special tax uh, taxes that are applied to the retirement of the Music City Center bond indebtedness, which is uh, a lot of money. Um, and it has, uh, let's see, so it's, it's in committee on, on both sides. Um, you know, I, I've learned a long time ago not to try to predict what the legislature is going to do. I would not be surprised if they um, coalesce around some measure or another to slap Metro around a little bit. Uh, and then they'll decide how bad they want to make it. The one that would be probably most impactful here is that tax uh, revocation. Um, the Metro Council one, you know, it would be uh, it would be a it would be a mess uh, for the 24, 23 and uh, elections and all that. They have to get redistricted and all that. It would be it would be chaotic. But it it's not going to you know it's not. It's not as financially impactful, at least, as the other one. Uh, the, the boards and commissions issue, um, they make the point that they're offering to put $500 million into the football stadium and all to have some say in the sports authority. Um, it's unusual in the way they've got the appointments laid out. Um, they're coming from the Senate speaker and the House speaker, which is a very unusual way to go about doing that. Usually it would be the governor. Um, so that's, that's where those stand. They haven't gone very far, but they're still out there plugging around, and I'm sure they're having conversations about how badly they want to whack Nashville at the side of the head. The other thing that's in the director's update uh, is not a legislative move. It is apparently strictly a budgetary change, and that is the one in which they are supplanting $8.5 million of CDC funding for HIV prevention programs with state dollars. Um, it's really still unclear exactly what that's going to mean. Um, we don't think that the money that comes to us uh, from that grant is likely to be affected. To, when, I, when I say us, I mean the health department. But there are some subrecipients in Davidson County who are worried that they will lose funding that way. Um, there is the hope amongst many in our end of the business um, that the state health department will uh, keep those people whole and continue that relationship with them. Um, the likeliest scenario, as I believe I've told you before, is that one of the recipients of some of that money is Planned Parenthood, and they do dearly like to um, make their dis 
taste for Planned Parenthood made apparent. So it's possible that they, it's, I'd say it's probable that they will lose that funding stream, but hopefully they will be the only ones. But to be decided. We, we've asked the health department quite a bit about, you know, how do you think this is going to play out? And to, so far, we really haven't gotten a lot of information. It may be that they're trying to figure it out at this point. This happened fairly abruptly, apparently. So how should we, how should, how should we be positioned to respond as a board or, or be aware? So I appreciate, I know we talked a couple months ago about you making sure that you're able to keep us up to date. Uh, is there anything that you need of us right now? Or there well, any I think the main thing that, that Metro be... needs to be prepared to do if it can um, is if some of the sub recipients in town do in fact lose that funding stream is to figure out some way to try to make them whole. Um, it's not a heck of a lot of money, I don't believe. The one I know about is 80 something thousand dollars. I'm not sure how much the others may be. Um, but to find some way for them to be, to not lose the capacity that they currently have. We'd like to see that the capacity that's available in the county is not diminished by this maneuver. Would be, that'd be our goal. And, and, it, and we don't know yet what that looks like, um, or even if it will happen. It's possible that they won't take it away from them, that they'll, they'll just simply funnel it straight from the state instead of, um, it's funnel them state dollars instead of CDC dollars. It's the same, they, they've pledged it'll be the same amount of money, I believe. Um, so technically, theoretically, there shouldn't be any diminution of funding, just they've taken control over where it goes. I, I would like to, um, I know that we have uh, community groups here or some, or at least one, maybe two community organizations represented. Um, I, I was wondering if there are any questions that might be lifted up for us to consider as a board, specifically League of Women Voters, Patty. Could you come up to the microphone? Hey, thank you. I'm Patty Scott, and I'm representing the Nashville League of Women Voters today. I was having a very hard time hearing. If you could just, yeah, if I, I don't think that there's anything that I would have a question about once I can hear what we were talking about. Because it's hard to hear when somebody's focused this way. Can we turn this off? Also? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank, thank you. That's helpful. So can you hear us? You just couldn't hear Mr. Sharp. Oh, this is so much better. Yes. <laughs> All right, Mr. Sharp, I'm going to ask you to come up and uh, do the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Is that better? Um, so the state, the last part, this funding part, the state is going to... Why don't I just talk to her? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. Is that, is that okay, Mom? Yeah. Yes. You're All right. right. Um, the state is going to take $8.5 million that has been coming to HIV prevention programs from the CDC and supplant it with state money. And whether the same recipients will receive the same amount of money or not, with the probable exception of Planned Parenthood, is currently unknown. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair. Dr. Shaw, Kai Kai. Good afternoon, board. I would like to uh, give you an update. Uh, Centers for AIDS Research, uh, they've sent out a survey to different agencies to see how they will be impacted by the cuts. Um, potential cuts, I should say. Um, and once they have that um, data collected, the mayors ending the HIV, HIV epidemic council will put together a letter um, and have different institutions to sign on to the letter. 
um, as far as how the, the results of the survey and how the, you know, the community is impacted, uh, could be impacted. So um, if the board would like to take a look at the letter once it's drafted and sign on, that would be great. I, I think it's, I think data is, is fantastic. So definitely we need that data. And I think we need to take it through the right protocols through Metro Legal to make sure that we're doing our due diligence. Do we have any idea when that survey will be completed? I think they're looking to do it within the next two to three weeks. Okay, and then we can follow up accordingly. And the, just the other thing is, is that we do have a meeting on March 1st with the health commissioner, the new health commissioner. So hopefully we'll be able to get some more answers there also. Okay, all right, that's helpful, thank you. And we've also reached out to uh, Shelby County, uh, Dr. Taylor. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. All right, anything else, any other questions, comments related to the legislative update? Oh, okay. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Next, again, we have Mr. Diamond for the equity pay update. You get tired of hearing from me here today. Um, is that, uh, thanks, Madam Chair and, and members of the board. Uh, last year, the, the board expressed interest in, in having uh, a pay equity study done uh, within the department and funding was requested uh, for fiscal year 23 and approved by, by the mayor's office and council. And so uh, at the start of this fiscal year in July, uh, the, the pay study was kind of kicked off and that uh, involved meeting with uh, Metro's contractors for these types of things, Deloitte, uh, and then providing them an enormous amount of uh, data on, on our employees and their salaries and their demographic information. And, our, our human resources crew was uh, was key to to assembling all that information and putting it into uh, some digestible uh, um, forms for them. And so, Deloitte uh, spent several months analyzing you know the initial data and came back with some uh, initial uh, observations. I wouldn't even call them findings now because uh, we are now to kind of look over what they produced and uh, kind of have some responses to it to see if we're all uh, kind of on the same page. And uh, they, they did notice that, that things are fairly good. Uh, currently there is a, a raw pay, pay gap for females at 93% uh, in the open range and 97% in step. Um, and BIPOC employees at 97% for open range and 98% for step. Um, but after they control for pay grade, um, there, there's not uh, any pay bias identified. Again, these are preliminary observations, not final findings as of yet. Uh, but the overall kind of observation is that um, pay is equitable at, at the you know, at the you know, regular salary grades, we just do not have a lot of, or we have more males and uh, white people in the higher pay grades. So uh, across the, the, the pay, pay grades, um, that, that's kind of what, the, what they found. Um, they did come up with a, a formula for kind of predicted salary that we don't necessarily agree with in some instances because, um, it looks at time and position, not necessarily time with the department. So people who have been in, been with the department a long time and been promoted along the way, um, it, it looks like you know, they consider them maybe overpaid uh, because if people are on up in a range and then get promoted, they're usually in a higher position in the range than if they were at the, the base. So uh, that's something that, that we're still uh, going to be working with Deloitte and, and coming up with maybe a better number on that. But um, like I said, there have been some observations, no findings as yet, so I'd be happy to entertain any uh, questions as, and answer as best I can. Um, but we're still uh, you know, uh, in the phase where we're analyzing and going to be res responding to them before they get into kind of phase two of their analysis. Thank you. Uh, first, I am really happy to make sure that we're moving in the right direction with gain, gathering information and, and data. So that's really important. I don't know if you can answer this question, but I think it's important to lift up. And also, I recognize that we have Attorney Wintress that starts on Monday. And I don't think that you've had a chance to be brought up to speed with this. So I, I'm, I'm going to be patient. 
but you, you mentioned, I think I heard you mention something in terms of uh, with regards to the pay disparity that uh, appears to be there that uh, bias is not necessarily, isn't likely to be a cause. And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering out loud if at the appropriate time we can better understand how bias is measured or accounted for or not accounted for. Um, but, but yes, I'm, I'm really excited to see this progressing and Attorney Wintress, I look forward to your perspective um, and you're working with the team on this as well. And that was, uh, if I may, discussed with, with Deloitte and that we, we, right. did, we, we did have some, some turnover at, at the HR manager position that we had a, a, a new leader. You know, this was even before it was posted, but we would have a new leader. And they, they said that this would kind of be a, a great time to, to present and work with uh, the new HR director whenever they were hired. And now that we know that we have one starting, starting Monday, I will uh, absolutely bring this up uh, in my, my first meeting uh, w with her uh, and in several subsequent meetings, I'm sure, because uh, this, this is as much or more an HR function than it is a, a finance function. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll, I'll be happy to share the uh, share the work uh, for sure. Because like I said, a HR uh, was incredible in gathering a lot of information that we did not necessarily have in digestible form. Uh, because um, as you may or may not know, our, our public health nurse ones have different starting salaries based on the degree that they have. So that wasn't something that we had in our file, in our, you know, in our computer database, because it's not something that, that we track other than their starting salaries. So our, our HR team spent a lot of time in the file room pulling uh, personnel files and analyzing, uh, you know, which, which degree they have or had uh, at the time they started. So, um, so the, the, this was a, a, a huge, huge undertaking by our staff to even get the, the data to Deloitte to, to start the process. All right, thank you. Uh, any other comments, questions, Dr. Griffin? Yeah, um, yeah. It's it's comforting that there aren't big differences. That at least the preliminary findings, um, but there are small differences that go away when you control for grade. And I just wonder if you should consider if it's appropriate to control for grade. That do certain people get preferentially put into higher grades? And I I think that's worth looking at whether controlling for grade is an appropriate thing to do. I think they're looking at it from both sides, That, uh, but I will absolutely uh, make, make that uh, comment to them. I was just, just something that might clarify that is to, to look at, are the grades indeed, are they judged fairly as well? Or, or is, is someone who's in position X and position Y, they're in the same grade, do they really belong in the same grade? I believe Metro HR reviewed that. For us, but I'm not certain. Right. I don't think this would be a Deloitte function okay. as part of the study, but um, Metro HR is intending to do a very large Metro wide pay study. Uh, I, I don't know if it'll be started. It, it, it won't be started in FY23. I believe they're asking for it as part of their budget uh, ask of, for FY24 for a, a, a large Metro wide study, but that, that would be something. Is that not, that's not what the thing was that happened last summer? There was a, there was that, a metro. That, that was only was a portion of that the, was a partial. Oh, but that was what happened. That, with the and, portion. and thank you for bringing that up. I meant to mention that in the um, in the facilities staff that uh, one of the reasons for or one of the, the, the encouraging things for our uh, maintenance staff was that they were looked at by Metro HR as part of their their study of trades and labor and how difficult uh, of a time they were having uh, attracting. Um, and retaining good uh, trades and labor uh, staffers, you know, the, and and you as a board were were generous in in adopting their recommendations and increasing those salaries, uh, you know, for for our staff, and they they did uh, appreciate that muchly because much because they were uh, they are they're still among our lowest paid uh, employees, but um, but absolutely they're talking about for for the entire uh, entire government just about. You know, I, it, I think it's impossible to study all, all of the, the, the ranges and, and, and positions, but that was primarily based off of uh, just the trades and labor. Um, and we had asked them to, to look at a couple of our positions, one of which was public health nurse one. So that's why we had such voluminous uh, numbers of, of reclassifications because um, we have 120-ish nurses. So, uh, and so that's 20, 25-30% of our, our staff right there.
Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Diamond. Next, we have the strategic update by Dr. Kong. Good afternoon, board members. Let me just situate before I... We're great? Good? Wonderful. Okay. Um, if it's okay, I did just want to make um, one comment about the conversation that was happening around the HIV funding. Um, just from an equity perspective, I just wanted to highlight that currently the priority populations, and they have been for decades, are uh, specifically men who have sex with men, particularly young black men, um, black women, Hispanic, Latin, Latinx, and women who have been sex trafficked. Um, but the governor has made it clear that his priority populations would instead be health workers, women, children, and people who have experienced sex trafficking trafficking. So I just wanted to mention that from an equity perspective in terms of even if funding is subsidized, priority populations who have needed uh, just proportionally more funding may not be as prioritized. A quick question on that. Yeah. So I think the, the equity lens that you're examining this is rooted in the disparities yes. data. And so the populations that the governor seems to be prioritizing, can you sort of just briefly talk about the disparities Absolutely. in that. Thank you, Chair Franklin. Um, that is exactly right. Um, and through the equity lens, these have been priority populations, the ones that I listed initially, because they have disproportionately uh, felt the most burden um, and have either the highest rates of um, being diagnosed or um, needing treatment. And so these uh, new classifications or priority populations listed by the governor in terms of health workers and children are not uh, the priority of populations that have shown through data either, either having the highest incidence or prevalence in terms of HIV AIDS. Yeah. Okay. Ms. So, Ms. Madam Chair, oh, uh, just to make an additional comment, I do know that from when I served on the board of um, Nashville Cares that at that point there were so the incidents amongst women in general who were not in a particular category that was at risk was so low that CDC ceased to fund any HIV prevention. So this wow. is flying in the face of, of what is being done federally. Absolutely. So thank you for letting me take that side note. Now I will go back to the programming. Um, so thank you for uh, the invitation to provide an update on the strategic plan. Um, Dr. Wright has uh, led the ELT through multiple uh, meetings just to be able to make sure that we are on track. And so I'm here just to report on our progress. Each of you should have received this document here. This timeline, does everyone have it in front of them? Wonderful. And so because I don't have a screen today, I needed to be a little bit creative and I did not want to print out the entire strategic plan for each of you. And so just to remind everybody um, sort of the format, this might look familiar. This is the tables um, that are included inside of the strategic plan. Um, I'm just showing it to you to remind you sort of the format. Um, and each one, each lever has an objective, activities, responsible timeline, process indicators, and outcomes. And so what Dr. Wright has led us through is also including start and complete dates, progress, and notes. And so this has, been, uh, this has been translated into an electronic version, an Excel spreadsheet that ELT, all ELT members will have access to and that we will be able to track in real time and update accordingly. And so I just wanted to show what that tracker looks like online. So to sort of focus this conversation, um, this deliverables timeline, there's a version of this that is currently in the strategic plan. And so I just adapted that timeline and then added some of the progress and notes that were updated in the tracker. So I'm not gonna go through each item because there's way too many, um, but I did want to just highlight uh, a few within each bucket. And so first, under the work implementation and action plans, one of the first ones that are highlighted that were, that was in terms of timeline, um, is the civil service work group. This is uh, led by Dr. Black uh, and facilitated by the Health Equity Bureau. And I've, we have been able to include a few updates on our progress within the board notes, but I did just wanna highlight that this has been already in progress since April, 2022, and that they have been working fervently to create recommendations uh, that are being prepared for our incoming HR director. And so I wanted to highlight that that process has been going and we are on track to complete that. Um, also, I wanted to highlight that the budget and finance participatory process that was highlighted in the strategic plan 
Uh, this has really been led by Dr. Wright and Jim Diamond. Um, and also, I, I might call on different ELT members just to be able to comment on your projects. Um, but uh, this process looks very different, even for myself, starting in 2021 versus this year. So I was really happy to see how intentional um, both Dr. Wright and Jim were in terms of being able to, one, create a robust process for prioritization by ELT members, uh, make invitations to all staff members to be able to participate, uh, and then actually have iterative processes to really get it down to our top X number of priorities that will be sent for budget requests. And then uh, another piece is that Dr. Wright also asked, uh, gave an anonymous survey to ELT members to be able to identify what went well with this process and how can we improve equity uh, throughout the budget process. What does SCPE stand for? That's a great question. Do, the new acronym? Yes. Mel, Dr. Black? Planning, performance, and equity. An evaluation. evaluation. Yeah. Yes. Strategic, uh, pl strategic planning. Performance and evaluation. And evaluation. And so yeah. this includes both Dr. Larson's team as well as epidemiology. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, another piece I wanted to mention um, is the COVID After Action Report. Uh, I understand that Rachel has included uh, the scope of work already in your board packet, so I won't go too much into that. But I did just want to say that process has been going. Um, thank you, Rachel, for inviting the equity team to be able to really bring an equity lens to that report. And I'm happy to say through our collaboration, we were able to invite 20 plus community based organizations who were most actively involved with the COVID-19 response in partnership with the Metro Public Health Department. Um, and so that's in progress right now. And then from there, there'll be um, some more uh, action plans based on the report created. Any questions? All right. The next piece I wanted to highlight is the workforce development plan. Um, Dr. Wright actually already last fall had initiated some progress on this in terms of being able to send surveys to employees, assessing what are some workforce development needs, either in terms of skills or trainings. Um, and then, of course, through the workforce grant, we will be hiring a workforce director. And so that job description has been finalized. And Dr. Black, who will be the direct supervisor of the workforce director, um, my understanding is posting that job within the next weeks. And so we're very excited for that to happen. Um, and they will help lead, especially in collaboration with our HR director, SPP and Health Equity, to be able to develop and implement the workforce development plan. Okay, so we're going to move back down now into data modernization work group. I also just wanted to mention that um, Dr. Carpenter, our epidemiology director, um, will be leading that group in partnership with the data moderniz modernization director. Um, my understanding is that Dr. Carpenter, Dr. Leslie, and Dr. Black have met recently to help also finalize that job description. And so that's moving along and this should be posted within the month. So before I go into program and project, are there any other items within work implementation and action plans that any board member would like me to clarify? Train the trainer evaluation plan. Absolutely. So this is the train the trainer model um, that both Tracy and Dr. Larson um, is sort of their dream project. And I think that they've been looking for time to be able to get this into motion. Um, Tracy is a skilled facilitator. And one of her objectives, from my understanding, is being able to really scale the number of facilitators available in the public health department. So she would be utilizing a train the trainer model, which is uh, from our objective one within workforce development to be able to scale that effort. And so this is an evaluation plan as part of one of the objectives to measure our impact and success. And this is Tracy Buck? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. We're almost there, just a few more. So for program and projects, of course, if I'm up here, I have to talk about health and all policies. Um, for f formalizing and scaling the health and all policies program, there's been a lot of effort here. Of course, we've talked about the summit. I also just want to mention that we had our first high up meet and greet at the public health department. I believe over 30 member, uh, different employees across metro agencies came, learned about um, the high up initiative. And my understanding is that Raquel has been just receiving so many different requests in terms of how do we get this health lens approach into our work, as well as new members joining the health and all policies coordinators table. And for the next few months, Raquel will be facilitating a lot of the sort of revamp and redefining of goals and really trying to create more opportunities for there to be cross-sector collaboration. Okay. Next is around the clearinghouse and the partnership inventory. 
Um, this is something that is really uh, central to the strategic plan because a lot of our objectives depend on the creation of this clearinghouse in order to drive different objectives. Um, so Zach Nite, the partnerships manager for the Health Equity Bureau, has been designing a uh, partnership survey as well as our PHAP fellow, Michaela Baptiste, is creating sort of a skeleton for what this clearinghouse could look like. Um, there are dollars in both disparities as well as a workforce grant um, to be able to contract out with uh, a developer to really create a robust online clearinghouse. Um, but that survey is almost complete and ready for dissemination and we should be on track to be able to fulfill the other objectives. Okay, the last one in the program and projects I would like to highlight is our health equity professional development. This has been a really exciting endeavor led by Jody Patterson, uh, who's behind me, as well as Elise Cruz. Um, and they have really engaged in a robust process, both with leadership as well as supervisors and staff across MPHD. So they spent the fall interviewing each ELT member and then any uh, employee that uh, ELT members identify that they should talk to spoke with supervisors and now are conducting four different listening sessions over the next couple of weeks to be able to hear from employees what are the different resources and training needs they have identified uh, throughout their work in terms of the specific context that they work in. And so they'll uh, be hosting those listening sessions and then we should be having a few specific trainings already ready to go, such as a Health Equity 101 training um, ready to go before the end of the month. And Jody's working closely with HR already to uh, ensure that it either can be available on LMS or different formats for employees. Okay, last piece. Any questions on program projects? Beautiful. The last one I'd like to highlight is from Reports and Frameworks is the Organizational Equity Statement. Uh, um, this has been a critical step towards just creating a foundation and a baseline for the, or how the organization commits to equity. Um, so an initial draft has been already created by the directors. They invited uh, the Health Equity Bureau to provide their expertise, um, be able to create uh, incorporate one, um, both the strategic plan actions as well as um, really uh, refine the ways that we are thinking through dismantling practices that have contributed to inequities. Um, so that draft has been created and then has been sent already to ELT. Um, and we have been waiting for our HR manager to be able to come. And one of the first actions next week is to be able to sit down and review that commitment statement. So a lot of these other items, um, they're not due for several months or for um, until next year, and so I won't go over those, but that's the overall update in terms of strategic plan work. The last note I'd like to make is that um, I just want to keep iterating that the workforce grant, um, I'm happy to say, provides funding or resources for virtually every single item on this list. And I recognize it's still only for five years, and so some of the conversations we're having at the leadership level is very intentionally figuring out how do we um, how do we ensure that we're capturing the success that we're having through the workforce grant so that we can make the case clearly for local budget requests? Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I do have a question, but I'd like to open it up to my colleagues first. Yeah, um, two questions, actually. Can we access that um, workforce director job description easily enough? How, how can we do that? I mean, it's just really interesting to, to me to, to know what, what that, and I think it's better when we know these positions, when they're starting, what the job description is. Okay, that would be great. And my other question is, um, where's the best place I can read about the health and all policies program? That's a great question. There's actually a health and all policies landing page that I can make sure that you get. Um, I also, um, ASTO has a really wonderful guide as well as NATO in terms of what it looks like at both the state and local level. And so I can send you the local level from NATO in terms of what HIAP looks like. That would be terrific. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. Um, could you just refresh us on, like you said, it's really important to capture your success so mm -hmm. that you what, what are your major sort of outcomes that you're looking at that, I, I know they were in the grant, but maybe you could just summarize. Yes, um, there are several measures included, but I do wanna preface with, this is actually one of the main tasks for the data modernization director is to work with the workforce director to develop metrics that we haven't used before. Um, the CDC 
has really prioritized also using qualitative metrics. And um, when we got the feedback from our grant application, several times it was noted, what are the qualitative metrics that you're gonna be using? Um, and so uh, I think that's a reflection of the fact that a lot of the measures are around employee well-being and satisfaction. So of course we can have retention numbers, we can have um, other more quantitative data metrics, but I think we're really gonna have to get creative in terms of really capturing um, what is either how are we capturing employee well-being um, as well as the ways that they feel invested. Um, I think beyond that, there's a lot of different metrics specifically for more external facing services. So of course for like community-based work, as mentioned, whether it's community health workers, um, national strong babies, care workers, et cetera, as well as our community listening sessions. Um, those are also metrics that we'll be working closely with the data modernization director to capture, not just how many listening sessions are we doing, but what does actual authentic engagement look like? And do we feel, I would be most interested in measuring, how do we measure sort of public perception or community trust? And what does that look like to increase that over the years? So I greatly appreciate that I'm a visual person. Thank you for <laughs> giving us something to, re to reflect on as you're bringing us through the update. Um, and it seems like a lot of things are on track. What I really want to know, and I'm going to invite Dr. Wright and Dr. Black to answer this, what is not working? What is off track? What are the opportunities that, that, we, should be, that we should understand that, um, that the department is facing right now? As far as the strategic plan, I, th I think all the items are on track um, at this moment. There's a lot of time left in the strategic plan and a lot of things to accomplish, but we're meeting on a regular basis and reviewing. So we know where we're at and we're, if we get ahead on some things behind on others, we can focus more time on those that are, we're, we're lagging on. So really that routine evaluation is gonna be very important as we move forward. Um, but we've only been working under this for, you know, a short period of time now. So we're still early in the process, but we seem to be on track with most of the, uh, well, actually all of the uh, items that we're supposed to be at this point. And we'll keep bringing that back to you on a regular basis also, so you know where we're at. Okay. I think my only note would be, not that it's necessarily contributed to being delayed, but I, I know that Laura and Jim, in terms of electronic health record, um, we're just still waiting on that. And that does drive a lot of the data modernization work. And so, Thank you. Absolutely. All right, next we have the report of the director, Dr. Wright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I would really like to thank um, all the staff again for uh, welcoming, welcoming us here to Woodbine. We do have a couple members of the uh, staff that are here. Would you mind just standing up so we can recognize you? <laughs> Thank you for coming. Laura, could you, you please introduce? introduce yourself? We'd love to know who you are. <laughs> Thank you for representing your teams here. Um, I did want to just re remind everybody that the reason, of course, we're here is that uh, this is our busiest clinic. Uh, we do have now two nurse practitioners that are working uh, on the family planning side, uh, and we're really out of room, uh, but we have the capacity to do a lot more within the community. And uh, most of the uh, individuals that we're getting are from the southeast region so as we look we're trying to look to that area um, so uh, with that said um, uh, Tom, Tom has already talked to, and others have talked about a lot of the things that are in my report the HIV piece uh, is important and hopefully we will be finding out more I actually am not sure that even the state health department fully understands and knows exactly how they're going to be doing that yet. I think 
uh, that's being very held, held very close to the chest at the moment. So hopefully we'll get some more information when we meet with uh, Commissioner Alvarado. Um, we are working through uh, a process where we're buying fentanyl test strips uh, and Narcan to be able to distribute out into the community. Um, the state actually is uh, going to fund some of this, uh, so we're working with them, but um, we will continue to look at that. We do have ongoing meetings now with a number of stakeholders here in the community on the opioid settlement money and making recommendations. And Dr. Smith uh, is on that committee. Uh, just wanted to remind you that the legislature did uh, remove the uh, pre local pre Emption for smoking bans on uh, at least in those establishments 21 and over and uh, starting March 1st uh, that will go into effect um, the enforcement piece will be through um, Hughes department uh, as they're doing inspections and such and really will be educational first and so and then uh, we'll look at if we have to we're hoping we don't have to do any disciplining. So, um, and then I do want to mention that we are in the process of doing the uh, COVID act after action report and that uh, that report should be done, is to, scheduled to be done by the end of June. And then we'll be bringing that to the board also to share. Um, other than that, there's uh, a lot of activity uh, in the department and uh, we continue to appreciate all of the uh, staff and all of the things they do day in and day out. Um, I will be sharing with you, uh, with the board members, if you want to attend, you're welcome to. We have a town hall coming up next Wednesday, 8.15 to 9.15, um, that you are welcome to, you know, sign on to and, and uh, see if you wish. So we'll share that link with you when, when it's out, okay? And uh, any questions? Any questions? I, I brought this up once before, but uh, I mean, the dental program seems really great. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any way of figuring out, like, who are the kids that are being missed, or are these, is this benefit being distributed equally? You know, are there disparities because you need parental permission or whatever? Um, yeah. We, we can have one. I probably think the best thing would be is to have somebody from that program come and present. I can I can speak anecdotally. Yeah. I had children that came through Metro. I still have a I have a daughter who's in fifth grade, and so, and I was, we were in the schools that were um, prioritized every year. So, parents do hear about this. It is out there, and and it is really paying attention to the, the demographics that probably have the, the greatest burden. So, but I think, I agree, I think it would be helpful to yeah. sort of hear yeah. an up-to-date. It is yeah. based on disparity. Right, I'm just wondering where, where it's offered, what percent of kids actually take advantage of yeah, it. We had, a, we had a really good presentation Which, on it from right. what I remember, maybe about two years ago. So it's time, it is right. time for an update yeah. on that anyway. I, I know think. that at one school alone, they did, uh, large number i keep several hundred at one just one school so and, and i right. think well, yeah. we keep seeing these thousands and i mean it yeah. seems great i'm just like wondering but you don't know what the base is that number 50%? is <laughs> yeah i'm kind of foggy on uh i think someone had someone pretty instrumental in it had just retired maybe um that or, that, dr party dr party probably yeah, just right 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 before right, right, after right. She retired. that's that's yeah. what it was okay so yeah yeah it, it, it's it's about time for yeah yeah thank you that uh, would be great we can get that Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. I'm just really curious and interested. <clears throat> we haven't talked much about the, the new commissioner um, mm -hmm. at the state. Do we have a lot or, so, well, let me just rephrase it. There's, it's twofold. Um, are we having much interaction with him or with... Uh, his he, people who are following his policies right we work obviously all of our departments work day in and day out with different parts of the tennessee mm -hmm. department of health and that's kind of the operational um alvarado i 
think is just stepping into his position. Uh, and so we haven't met him and have any idea about, you know, what his take is going to be. So that's going to be helpful because obviously policy sets processes and actions. So that's going to be a very important meeting where we plan to have some discussion to, to try and understand that. Because he is making some declarations. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess back to the previous conversation we had about HIV, um, it's kind of apples and oranges, but are, uh, Chattanooga and, and Memphis and Knoxville having any of the concerns that we as National Health Department are having with this whole legislative thing? We, uh, maybe Tom knows that. They are not. Uh, they are specifically excluded because it is a size-based, uh, so it's to, okay. it's really focused on Nashville, be, and it's really partly at least due to some actions that the council. There is, yeah, that, from that piece. So is there any merit in... Well, come um, up to the microphone, please. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel Franklin with uh, Communicable Disease and Emergency Preparedness. I, within that bureau, I oversee STD outreach. Um, I can tell you that the Tennessee Department of Health is not dealing with this these cuts very well. We I was on a call about a week and a half ago um, they have called in folks uh, for employee EAP and things like that, and it's statewide. Uh, and all of the folks at the end of the conference call, we do a round robin of the regional leadership of, of communicable disease and emergency preparedness where HIV resides, and everyone is, is uh, very concerned about it. Okay, so, so is there any... Um anything that we could gain by having a more collaborative set of discussions with those folks? I, I mean, I don't know. It just I don't seems know if like there's anything the four main to cities be in the state are aligned with their concerns, that there might be some merit in, a in lot. having a, a stronger voice. Right. That's, it's something to think about. I mean, I know there's a lot of voices. And that's, well, I really am just reporting on the what I've seen across the state from the conversations that I've had. Well, what's the downside to trying to to interact with them a little bit more and find out where they stand and what their their positions are? I, I, I think, I think you it, have an appoint. You have a meeting on the first right. with the new we commissioner. Have a meeting the first. And and I will also say that like I think what I'm getting gathering from your sentiments is that the rank and file, the folks that do this all day, every day that have been doing this for years are all on one accord. Absolutely. Um, and so this is, this is a challenge for the public health workforce in general. And that your board is pushing you to <laughs> yeah. have you. some kind of a, a statement to, to oh. understand better. Right. I, I, you know, like. it is a disparity disparity there, um, as uh, Dr. Kong just, you know, informed you, uh, they have changed the focus. Uh, we will definitely be bringing that up with the commissioner, but um, this also comes from the governor. So I'm not right. sure how much we can change that, but the other piece is if we see significant cuts locally, we can look to our own council uh, and local funds to potentially make up funds if we need to. I mean, whether they whether it could be funded or not, don't know. But um, if the governor is not going to accept the funds from the feds, yeah. Well, it's a two it's a two pronged issue for me. One is the 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 people who are not going to get served potentially, right. but also that we, and I don't know if others agree, but I, I do think that there are times that we need to be pretty strong in stating uh, the concerns. And that can backfire, I know, but I don't know if there's a way that this board can back you well, in talking right. to Dr. Alvarado. And I don't want to speak for anybody else on this board, I but I just think, gosh, this is, this is kind of yeah. overwhelming. I mean, I, I think that 
based on what we've been presented with today, uh, it seems as though people are mobilizing and putting in plans of action as it stands. Uh, I, I, I think getting a little bit more information and like having Dr. Wright meet with uh, Mr. Alvarado and having the, you know, the kind of knowing what the lay of the land is, because as, as kind of mentioned, we still don't know what the full response is at right. this point. And, that's a good yeah. point. and so, you know, I mean, I think it would be a little rash to, to uh, make a strong statement when we don't know what we're making a strong statement about right now. Uh, but uh, I think that I, I, I tend to trust the, the voices in the room that uh, are, that have stakes in it. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to like kind of let them have that for a little while and then I think that there are from one from things I know I know that there are a number of local individuals that are related to this that are having a lot of discussions at the state level and such to try and 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 really voice what their concerns are and I think right now the push is we're just concerned about how is this funding going to break down and make sure that it does not change as far as its emphasis on these groups that have a disparity in their overall care and this also has a lot of uh, national traction i mean yes. this is something that is not just of our concern and, and people are right. watching what we do very closely here so exactly. especially here in nashville so i think you know again i think so far we have a pretty good handle on uh you know and it's a uh, a lot of landmines here yeah. so yeah. Na uh even nacho has reached out to us locally here Good, so. good. Okay, that's good to know. And, and that's I an know that point. Uh, I know that the other communities, community. such as Memphis, are also very concerned. Okay. So I have a question for clarification. That at present, what we're talking about is the money that is for prevention, correct? At present. At present. So I so I think that the larger concern is where is this going? Right. And it, prevention from what we can find not, not one dollar out of what we get for our services that we provide from the grants uh, but it's going to be more third-party providers of education prevention other community groups will be affected the most well and ultimately if the dollars are redistributed as they're discussing we probably will have a problem because sure. we will not be talking, we'll not be reaching the right people. Exactly. Yeah. We'll have a problem, yeah. just not, we're not getting money sure. taken from us. But yeah. we could definitely see a problem if, if trends start mm -hmm. going backwards. Right, right. That's, and that's, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's the real issue there. Mm -hmm. Dr. I'll step up because my voice tends to be low. I would say that um, the second cut that we're concerned about is the uh, three, excuse me, the um, Ryan White Part B funding that um, the uh, state has said that um, areas served by, by Part A that we're in charge of, they will no longer fund. It will be a 10% cut of those services um, this upcoming fiscal year um, and then a full 90%. So. 100% the next full, uh, fiscal year. So our HRSA project officer has asked us to get together a group of people with lived experiences and other experts to see how we can adjust our budget to cover those costs. And also we've asked HRSA, can they expand our budget? Um, it's a little more than $4 million, but if we're having to cover 13 counties, that's going to affect uh, the Part A funds. All right, any other questions for Dr. Wright? Okay, great, thank you. So now we'll move forward with the director's report. What I appreciate about today's conversation is that we have been focused on public health. And I'd like to take a moment for us to pause and remember um, and, and other areas that we should also be focusing on. So I'm going to ask your grace for about uh, five minutes. Policing and systemic racism are two forces which combine significantly impact the health of people of color, especially black people. Police use of force is the sixth leading cause of death 
for black men who are two and a half times more likely to be killed by police than white men. These fatal encounters can have wide reaching mental health impacts on others. Deaths of unarmed black individuals at the hands of law enforcement cause adverse mental health outcomes. Increasing the number of self-reported poor mental health days among other black adults. Similarly, pretextual police stops are associated with the increased symptoms of anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. The chronic stress of racism, which includes such experiences, is also associated with lowering Black people's overall life expectancy. The public health approach to solving police violence and institutional racism should target structural inequities by improving social determinants of health. Policing is a critical but under-acknowledged determinant of health because it perpetuates adverse health outcomes like those cited, in, cited above in populations that already experience health inequities. It must be addressed in order to create healthier and safer communities. The American Public Health Association made a series of policy recommendations to increase public safety in a manner that truly increases safety for people of color and improves social determinants. Notable action items include funding research on the health consequences of police violence among black individuals, people of color, people with disabilities or mental illness, LGBTQ plus populations and other marginalized communities. Decriminalizing activities shaped and driven by experiences of oppression such as substance abuse or substance use and possession, loitering and sex work. Also redirecting funds from law enforcement to fund programs that meet human needs, promote healthy communities and reduce structural inequities such as mental health intervention, employment programs and education. In considering these approaches, it is important to remember that not all police violence involves the police. The negative impact of over policing of black people through community policing by civilians, uh, specifically that was the cause of death for Mr. Ahmad Arbery and uh, Mr. Trayvon Martin, is also a serious cause for concern. We can begin to solve this public health crisis by prioritizing policing and systemic racism as critical social determinants of health. Doing so will truly begin to address the underlying needs of vulnerable communities. Not only is this the best way to improve health outcomes for black individuals in America, it is essential to improving morbidity outcomes. In conclusion, the failure to address structural racism in policing makes it equitable, makes equitable public health outcomes impossible when it contributes to deadly disparities for people of color. It is time for practitioners and policymakers to shift focus to creating policy that will create healthy communities by increasing equity and social determinants of health. These are not my words. These, this is an article and I'm going to submit it to, um, for the minutes, for the link, the Network for Public Health Law. There are similar uh, narratives and background with uh, the American Public Health Association and also with the Centers for Disease Control. When I was the director of the Office of Minority Health at the Tennessee Department of Health in 2000, um, I think it was 2014, maybe 2015. At that time, Tennessee was number one in the country for violence as a public health concern. Violence happens in all different shapes and forms. And as we've seen in the media over and over and over again, and most recently um, in our own backyard, literally here in Nashville and in our neighboring backyard in Memphis, it's still here. And we have to be able to talk about this as a public health issue. All of the populations that we've talked about today with the other areas are impacted also by police violence, 
by an individual one-on-one um, -on -one violence, and it is rooted in race. As uncomfortable as it is to talk about that sometimes, we can't escape the data. And so just like we talk about dental, just like we talk about breastfeeding, we talk about HIV, we talk about smoking, we have to be able to champion conversations about police violence and community violence that disproportionately impacts certain demographics of our community. So that is my call to action. I'm not going to let up on this. I'm going to lean in harder for two reasons. One, I come from a family of law enforcement. And so I'm gonna hold my family accountable and I have been holding my family accountable, asking questions and having tough discussions with them. Luckily, my family member has never had to discharge his weapon. And luckily he's never been in a similar incident but I know the slippery slope and I know how easily this can happen. And I also know that his life is at risk from others that see his blue uniform and are just scared as all get out. And the other reason I'm championing this is because I think all of us have probably, I would not be surprised if many of us have been pulled over in a traffic stop, but that anxiety that stress is real. I was driving from Knoxville to Chattanooga. This is several years ago. And I was on work for the Tennessee Department of Health and I was pulled over by a trooper. I was going through Ray County. I used to play basketball in Ray County and I knew the roads and I was pulled over in Ray County. I can't tell you how scared I was to not take my hands off the steering wheel I was going under the speed limit. Speed limit was 60, I was going 55. It was on one of the highways, it wasn't on the interstate. And I was pulled over because the trooper said that he couldn't see my seatbelt because at that time my hair was longer and it sort of covered. But he said he couldn't see my seatbelt. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world are you seeing everyone else's seatbelts going through there? I speculated from lived experience that I was pulled over because of my race. I was out of place in Ray County. I was scared. I couldn't call my husband because I was afraid to take my hands off the police, off the steering wheel. Everything happened. He just checked me out. I had my work ID, let me go. But that fear for something as benign as a traffic stop is real. Yes. And when you see what we see and hear the same narratives all over the place, we get the sound bites and then they go away with the next news cycle. But we are responsible for the public health of our community. And there is no other agency that can speak to this, that can speak to health and all policies like the Metro Public Health Department. So my call to action for all of us within in this room and also for the record, because I know that this is being recorded, is that we champion these conversations. Don't get me wrong, we're gonna stay in our lane. We're not going to, it has nothing to do with how we treat the police department. We're not advocating for anything, but we can advocate and inform and educate on why this is a public health crisis and why it's important and we can, help inform um, folks of the root causes of this. I will say that I was um, disappointed that we didn't bring this up in the conversation today, but I did not, and I was on the fence about saying something today, but I, I thought that um, we had to say it, we had to get it in there for the record. And so I'm gonna keep pushing on this. I hope my colleagues will join us. And, I, and if you disagree, let's have courageous conversations, but we're doing the work of the people. Everyone's lives are important and we have to go where data takes us like we do with all of our other public health um, outcomes. And, um, and this is one of them. So I will stop there and I will make space for my colleagues if you have a response or any comments that you'd like to share. Just thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, when you're talking about being pulled over, uh, being pulled over shouldn't be a capital offense, period. 
uh, you know, and, and to think, I mean, just my lived experience, uh, when I'm pulled over, nobody knows who I am. They don't know about my degrees. They don't know uh, anything about me except what they see. And I know that what some people see causes fear. And people who are fearful act in ways that they can't control. And I, at the risk of, I don't want to get too emotional about it, but I'm, I'm thank, part of why I didn't say too much is because I'm just thankful that you have the courage to, to speak for it. Uh, I've been to the point where I can't watch footage. I refuse to watch footage. Um, it could be me. It could be somebody I know. Uh, and, and to the point that you make about health, and I know we're here to talk about public health, but you know, my own mental health, it, it, it can be debilitating at times to, to have to live this experience. And so thank you for putting it in the forefront. Uh, conversations are uncomfortable on all sides. It's uncomfortable for me to talk about it. Uh, but uh, the challenge of, of doing so, I won't ever back down from. And so thank you for, for making space for that. Uh, you know, this is, we all have different lived experiences. Um, and you, you come from a family of, 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 of you know, of public servants. I also come from a fam family of public servants. And I, I too hold them accountable for their actions as much as they hold me accountable for my actions as a physician. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that and, that, and, and to have these kind of conversations and to talk about it. You know, I have a standard to meet. If I don't meet the standard, I'm called to question. I'm called to task. And I think everyone else in every other line of work should be held the same. So again, thank you. That for many years now, we have talked about the importance of looking at violence. Mm -hmm. David Satcher in the 90s talked about de violence being a public health issue. And, and so I'm very gratified that we as a department now are looking at violence in that kind of way. And then when you talk about the police element of it, that is yet another dimension. And I think that it's, it's also something that is having worked with the police department for a very long time and being very, very glad that I did um, for lots of, of reasons. Um, I don't disagree that it is, it is an extraordinarily important time to very carefully think through how do we all want to feel safe? And how do we help those who are most vulnerable become more assured that at least something is happening? And race is a huge deal. I think um, it's way overdue to be talking about this. At the same time, I'm gonna say, we're so way overdue to be acting on things like domestic violence, which has been forever in the forefront for decades, if not centuries, millennia, and still we have so many people dying. So I'm just gratified on two fronts. One, that violence is an issue, is in front of us, as uncomfortable as it may be, and then what you have just done, Tanae, in terms of bringing home the reality of the whole dimension of policing and violence. So I too, thank you. I think particularly now, conversations like these are important because of not just what happened in our own backyard and in Memphis, but other conversations that are wanting to shift the facts in a different direction so that the issue of race is not focused on those who are experiencing the victimization, but turned in the other direction. And so having difficult conversations, you mentioned PTSD, 
the issues of violence, when you look at the criteria, do not fit under PTSD. And so that further distances the acknowledgement of people's lived experiences, which prevents them from getting the help they need because of those lived experiences. And so I think it's important, as you say, for us to talk about um, community violence, police violence in all areas so that they're not just segmented in specific types of conversations and arenas. So thank you. Um, I would just um, like to sort of say from the perspective of a person who is sort of on the other end of the conversation, that I think it is critical that we not immediately assume that we are personally being assaulted, that our character is being assaulted and putting up our guard and not being receptive to the conversation. I mean, I feel that as a person who grew up in a country environment, as a smart, nerdy, gay kid who was less than masculine, I felt that I understood that, but I didn't. It's not the same thing. And I found myself sometimes putting my guard up and having conversations. And I just think we need to listen. Don't feel like we have to speak, listen. Don't feel like we have to judge, we have to think we are guilty personally. But do think about what is back there in the back of your head that you learned as a child that's sort of ingrained there. And what do you do to unwind that? And then how can you have conversations with other people and kind of try to help them see the differences there? As I said before, those were not my words. Um, that was from the public health that, uh, the Network for Public Health Law. I will share that link. So uh, they will be in the minutes. And then those that, um, when you have a moment, if you'd like to delve deeper, into the background, you're welcome to. I will say that um, following the events uh, that played out in the media a couple of weeks ago, uh, Dr. Wright did reach out to uh, Chief Drake for a conversation. Um, thank you, Dr. Wright, for allowing me to join that conversation. And so it's a conversation. Um, but I also know that we have a lot to focus on in public health, and I'm not asking us to like just be tunnel vision, but everything is interrelated. And so I think we, we owe it to ourselves and um, to do the right work. Um, and so we have to sort of pull up and be strategic about how we think about public health in all aspects. Um, and also, uh, how data plays a role with regards to, or disaggregated data plays a role with regards to subpopulations and subgroups and communities. So thank you for this conversation. Okay, so next we have new business. Um, so this is a portion where we review the board requests of the department and also the departmental requests of the board. So the questions that the requests that we have for the team and then also that the team has for us. So we get homework too. With, uh, for me, I think that there are two things that reports that we had today that we didn't have handouts. If we can have those notes or those presentations in the record so we can reflect on that. I'm thinking the pay equity study and also the facilities overview would be helpful. Um, I know we, we talk a lot, but sometimes it's, it's helpful just to orient um, on that. And then I will let my colleagues review and um, lift up any concerns that they would have for the word requests. And also Dr. Wright, ELT members, Dr. Black, if you have any requests for the board. How can we serve you? Dr. 
left or right? We did discuss this uh, Monday at our ELT. I haven't had anything brought directly to me at this point, but um, continued support, especially as we undergo and find out more about the HIV issue and um, being a resource if we need you. We do have a number of lobbying for Metro, um, but they do at times reach out for different expertise to talk with the state. So just if your support uh, in that regard, if we need you. And will you keep us up to, I mean, I know this is legislative session and things move quickly. So please just keep us updated, even though in between our meetings, that would be great. Thank you. All right, let's move on to employee recognition. So let's focus on our team members. Sure. Madam Chair, there are uh, three individuals I'd like to uh, make you aware of. Uh, they have been, uh, since our last presentation at the retreat, uh, we've actually had three new employees of the month. Um, we had Talia Mojé, who was uh, November's, uh, and I'd like to read on each of them just their nomination. So Talia was nominated for employee of the month for her work smoothing out some wrinkles for those of the TB elimination, Ryan White, and hepatitis C programs. Her computer skills help ensure work be, can be done in the easiest and most convenient way, and she's always willing to help others learn. Uh, Talia is helpful in many ways, offering assistance for outreach events on nights and weekends. Talia's positive attitude is inspiring, and her choice as an employee, employee of the month was an easy one to make. So, uh, for uh, December, uh, Danielle Duke was the employee of the month, and she was nominated uh, in recognition of her work with the department's telehealth kit trainings. Division of Prevention and Wellness organizes trainings with some of our community's more valuable, or excuse me, more vulnerable populations. <clears throat> and Danielle worked to make sure everything is as inclusive and accessible as possible. Danielle took a creative approach to helping a participant use voice commands to make her telehealth kit work for her. Thanks to that innovative approach to ensuring our programs work for everyone, Danielle is helping to make sure our community can get the most out of their work, out of our work. We're proud to name Danielle Duke the Employee of the Month. And finally, for January of uh, this year, uh, Christian Williams. Christian was nominated for always thinking of new ways to engage her staff and boost employee morale uh, at the East Clinic. Christian jumps in to help whenever it is needed, going above and beyond to make sure the clinic runs as smoothly as possible. Recently, the team at East had a quick turnaround on a pharmacy order, and Christian took it upon herself to create an inventory of all family planning products, sharing that template with other clinic managers to make sure future events like this are as efficient as possible. Christian's out-of-the-box thinking and efforts to provide a positive clinic experience for everyone made her a great candidate for Employee of the Month. So with that, I hope I can leave you on a, a joyous note. And uh, that's uh, the Employees of the Month for the last three months. And do we have, pick, will we be able to see pictures? Y yes. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll send out, okay. we always take a picture with them. And so we'll send those include that right. in the other information. Congratulations. All right, so uh, our last agenda item. I will entertain a motion for adjournment of the Board of Health meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion made by Dr. Williamson, seconded by Dr. Griffin. All in favor? None opposed. Motion carries. Meeting adjourned. I hereby... Uh, open the civil service board meeting. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov 